title is The Three Lies of Evolution. I'm wearing my men's shirt, so everyone knows I'm in the Genius Club. But to stay humble, I, I have this cross, which just happens to dangle right, right in the center of the men's symbol. This is not a satanic symbol. It's an M, okay, for, for men's well, Oh, I need to turn on my, my mic, okay. All right, uh, the red light should be on behind me. But is there a red light? Oh, red light? No red light. Okay, all right, let's go. Okay, there we go. I guess I'm good now. Hey, 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 okay. Uh, but, um, I mean, I, I, when I do this kind of talk on a college campus, it's nice to have a provocative title that'll bring people and get them interested and excited already. So the three lies of evolution is kind of good when you're speaking in the geology department or something like that. Um, but, but it's true. Um, that, that this is this whole evolution thing is based on a set of presuppositions and faith-based, dogmatic, extreme, very brave and courageous faith. Not based on the scientific method or data, evidence, or fossils, or the laws of science. As a matter of fact, most, and you're going to see, it's very easy to discount the three main lines of evolution, the three main steps of how everything got here without there being a God. That's what the whole point is uh, for evolution, um, is, is to be a support for atheism. And uh, I'll be speaking at the Free World Baptist Convention tomorrow and the next day on, on these things in three talks. So I can unpack it a little bit more, but again, uh, Mark said I can have all the time I want today. So, yeah, and I tried not to go over too. I don't know when your church usually ends, but I imagine it was later today. But I also preached some. Okay. So now what I'll do is I'll be doing the science. But yes, the three basic steps or tenets of uh, the worldview you've got to have if you don't believe there is a God. Um, and you do believe in evolution. So we'll, we'll be looking at those things. Okay, yes, and there I started out with that, but those of you who were here earlier saw that, so joke's over. Okay, <clears throat> this is from uh, GeoTimes, an evolutionist journal in 2005 in an article called Geology versus Physics. Look what this geologist says. <clears throat> Evolutionists have physics envy. They tell the public that the science behind evolution is the same science that sent people to the moon and cures diseases. It's not. The science behind evolution is not empirical, but forensic. You know, how many ever seen, you know, this, uh, CSI, you know, crime scene investigations? Forensic science is trying to figure out what could have happened and doing your best after the fact. You see, the scientific method demands experiment and uh, reproduction of the event and try it over and over again and there's no way to do that for anything in history. So both creation and, and evolution are not fit scientific theories. They're, now you have to think how we came here so we have these ideas but they're not testable or falsifiable or provable or experimentable or repeatable or measurable or observable. Now you can do all kinds of things that are like that, but you really can't do that with either of these things. We'll admit that, they won't. So let's, let's get into it. But, okay, it's forensic science trying to figure out what happened in the past, which is always an inexact science, unless somebody invents a uh, sports car that can go back, you know, at 88 miles an hour back to the future. Okay, then, then we might be a DeLorean, that's the name of it. <clears throat> The science behind evolution is not empirical, but forensic. No testing, no observations, no repeatability, no falsification. I think this is what the public discerns, that evolution is just a bunch of just-so stories disguised as legitimate science. And this is a problem. It's why evolutionists get so angry so quick, is because, uh, well, you got a cornered snake. They, they, they know they're vulnerable. Uh, nobody's more touchy than someone who's lying about something. You know, hey! attention to that man behind the curtain. <laughs> the great Oz has spoken. You know, they get real touchy about it. And there's a reason. He thinks he does protest too much. This is Nikola Tesla. I told you I think he was really cool. He demonstrated the wireless transmission of power in 1893. He invented remote control devices. He made a little remote control boat and showed it to 
some military people, the United States uh, government, back you know around the turn of the century, the other century, and he made this boat. He had a little control thing. He made this boat kind of like one of those drones. Okay, he made this boat swim around, and he said, "I'm going to make it do a figure eight now." And all these guys, these big military guys in the U.S. military, said, "No, there's a man in that. There's a man in that little boat." And so they brought it over and opened it and showed him it. And he proved that he invented remote control in 1893. But what were you going to control with it? No one could figure out a good use for it. And so way, at least 50 years ahead of his time, uh, classified as a mad scientist for Nikola Tesla, died penniless. But it's a long story. Interesting guy. But look at what he said. He said, the scientists of today think deeply instead of clearly. One must be sane to think clearly, but one can think deeply and be quite insane, which I think is an explanation, again, for how people could stick so, so tenaciously to evolution in spite of all the data, all the problems. <clears throat> and here's a more famous person in science today, Dr. Sheldon Cooper. Don't you think if I were wrong, I'd know it? You know, and that's kind of the attitude that I run into. I had one, prof one professor at University of Tennessee, Knoxville, Mitch Cruzan, who was the vice president of the Darwin Coalition, a national evolutionist group. Me and him were talking on friendly terms. And he said, I don't see how you can believe what you believe, Dr. Jackson. How could you? So I gave him some things, because I thought he was really asking. <laughs> and then I, I told him, well, I don't see how you can believe what you believe. What's the evidence on your side? And he went, well, <laughs> You and I are standing here having this conversation, Dr. Jackson. Now how else could that be, unless evolution did it? That would be logical proof if you already knew evolution was true. But you see, this is setting the premise that you're actually trying to prove. And that was, Dr. Cruz is a smart man. He, a smart man, I talked to him, I know he's smart. But he just didn't know what he had just said. Like when Richard Dawkins said, of course evolution has been observed, it just hasn't been observed while it was happening. You know, they don't get that they're, they're making these brain skips and, and they can't. You know, my colleagues are trapped in an illusion they can't get out of. I used to believe in evolution until I got saved. I know I was 17, but I was already Mr. Little Science Whiz Geek Kid. As much as you could be back there. Where is Dave when I needed to hear this? When I was in seventh grade, I thought I'd invented parallel circuitry. When I was in fourth grade, I was breeding land snails. And they laid eggs, little baby snails came out and everything. I had a telescope and a microscope, a little electronics kit. You know, I mean, I was, my mom was a secretary working for NASA when I was six. And she, she took dictation from Carl Sagan when he was a fair haired boy at NASA. We'd watch the Friendship and Mercury capsule launches on TV, and they'd be inter interviewing scientists, and Mom would say, that's my boss, Dr. Ladere. You know, and I'm like, really? You know, and uh, she, she knew these people, and, and, and they, she, they, all these scientists knew that my mother had a six-year-old little science geek boy at home, and they'd send me the newest copies of the glossy photos from the newest probe to Mars or the moon and stuff, and had little model rockets and everything. You know, and I, was, and I had this big fold-out map of the solar system, and I had all the stats for all the planets memorized. Yeah, like 20 years later, I started teaching science, and the stats, we had a lot more moons for Jupiter by then, and Saturn. You know, I don't know what it's up to now, 50 and for Saturn, lots of these little moonlets. Well, anyway, um, so I, I did, I, I really, really believed in evolution. By that time, I was already cemented into it. I knew I wanted to be a science teacher. The day I got saved, I got delivered of evolution. Some people, when they get saved, they get delivered of crack cocaine or whatever addictions. They, and, and some people, some miracle thing happens or, sudden, or gradually, slowly. I suddenly, the day I got saved, I suddenly knew the whole Bible was true, which meant evolution couldn't be true. And then I went on a, a journey to try and figure out, well, well then my, I, I never heard anything wrong about evolution. What, so I started trying to find out how that worked in reality and science, and then I, I got into all these other kinds of matters, which is why it mattered so much to me, because I was a little science geek, and uh, I thought science was the ultimate answers to everything. And 
It is, in a lot of ways. Science is a search for the truth, and so is religion. I said that this morning. And truth, Jesus said, will make you free. Truth is good. It's always good. Jesus said, I am the way and the, and the life. No man comes to Father but by me. So truth is, is an extremely important and valuable thing in the Christian faith. It's also an extremely important and valuable thing in all that matters in science. You know, I've, I was debating three evolutionists against me at Greencastle, Indiana, at DePaul University, and I made the statement that science is a search for the truth. And one of them, uh, they all just about fell out of their seats to contradict me. No, 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 it's not, it's not about truth. And one of them said, science isn't about the truth. It's a discussion about the truth. And I'm like, well, if you gotta, you know, have them puking, you know, stuff like that, if you gotta fuzzy up everything, what's that say about your argument? Well, that same guy wouldn't even shake my hand after the debate was over, which always lets you know how it went. <laughs> okay. Here's, here's Calvin selling great ideas for a dollar, like uh, lemonade stand. Well, how do I know your ideas are great? It says so on my sign. You want one? Well, I don't have a dollar. No problem. You can put 50 cents down and pay 100% interest in dime installments over the next 10 days. And of course, he's left alone now. People just don't know a great idea when they hear one. So that's the way evolutionists treat me. Don't you understand? This is great, the explanatory power of this theory. And I'm like, as they say, they always tell me, the evidence is overwhelming, Dr. Jackson. I always like to say back, well, I'm a little underwhelmed. Could you show me some of this overwhelming evidence? And, and they normally won't. But if they do, of course, it's so easy to shoot them down, like play pigeons. It's child's play. As long as I don't let them fluster me and I stay in God's spirit and my mind stays clear and all the science knowledge is on tap and, of course, science extinguishes evolutionary faith. <clears throat> Marilyn Bosomon is the most powerful, uh, most, most powerful, the most famous member of Menza. She is in the Guinness Book of World Record as having the highest IQ in the world, 228. Uh, she did that. The test only goes to 200. But anyway, there she is. And she said this in her article, uh, Ask Maryland in Parade Magazine, <clears throat> be able to defend your arguments in a rational way. Otherwise, all you have is a what? <laughs> Nothing wrong with an opinion, unless you go around saying it's a fact, and you also go around saying other people have to believe it too, or they're stupid. Now, you, you've perverted what an opinion rightfully is, and only ought to be. Albert Einstein said, the important thing is not to stop questioning. Question me. Question the Bible. Question Darwin. Question college professors. Question the media. Question political candidates. You should question everything. You should test the spirits to see whether they're of God or not. You know, and anybody that says, I'm immune to that, you have no right to ask me penetrating questions. Or I'm angry with you now because you've asked me a penetrating question. Again, they're hiding something. And if someone answers you and says, well, this is super, super complicated. Well, if they can't make it easy to understand, chances are the next thing that's coming out of their mouth is a lie, and they're just getting you ready for it. I'm sorry. You ought to be able to explain something. Einstein also said, everything ought to be made as simple as possible, but not simpler than that. The dude got the entire universe down to three variables. E equals what? mc squared. That's, that, that's amazing. The real equation should be four pages long. Have you seen Schrodinger's wave equation? Mm -hmm. I saw a t-shirt and it pretty much filled the whole front in small print. Yeah. So, so Einstein's genius was finding the simple keys to the universe. And it's always been. Genius is earmarked by uh, simplicity and elegance in scientific thinking. Okay, that was my intro. <clears throat> this is Mark's fault. Okay. Now, the three lies of evolution, which also happen to be the three main points of evolution. We're going to get to that in a minute. Uh, Linus Pauling. How many of you know vitamin C is good for colds? Linus Pauling discovered that. He also won the Nobel Prize for, in 1930, discovering the principle of electronegativity. He also won the Nobel Peace Prize in the 1960s for... Uh, uh, for being a famous scientist against the proliferation of nuclear weapons. 
And he also started the Linus Pauling Institute when he was 77. And he, uh, well, he's kind of a, he's an, he, well, I don't know if he was a, a believer in God or not. I know he was an evolutionist. Uh, but he's one of my heroes because he had a lot of integrity. And uh, Linus Pauling said, science is the search for the truth, the effort to understand the world. So there it is from, from somebody who knows what he's talking about with science. Oh, and he also did research on all vitamins and things uh, later on in life. Evolution is something, but science, it's not. Okay, It's some other kind of thing like a of, of religious faith or a, uh, a posit, hmm? an opinion. Yeah. Darwin himself said um, in a letter to his friend Asa Gray, who was a professor of biology at Harvard at the time, he said, I am quite conscious that my speculations run quite beyond the bounds of true science. Darwin knew it was iffy. Darwin was really not all that gung-ho about his own theory. He was so shy. He was naturally shy. In the 1930s, he started writing the book. It wasn't until the late 1950s, I mean 1850s, that he published the book. His friends urged him, you ought to publish this thing. Um, and he wasn't real sure of his own theory. Um, this guy worked for the Atomic Energy Commission in 1959, and he said this. In 1959, that's an important year, because it was the 100th anniversary of Darwin's book. So everyone was talking about Darwin that year. In explaining evolution, we do not have one iota of fact. It is a tangled mishmash of guessing games and figure juggling. And it really hasn't changed much since then, except they've gotten better at the juggling. In 1987, in Nature magazine, the most premier journal of science in the world, Bertrand Ehrlich said, Our theory of evolution has become one which cannot be refuted by any possible evidence. It is thus outside of empirical science. Um, I was talking to Jonathan after the service this morning, and he said, you know, uh, Bill Nye's debate with Ken Ham said, if you could just show me one fossil, one piece of evidence to prove evolution wasn't true, then, then that would do it. Well, and so I immediately showed him how, how many have heard of the Lucy fossil? The Lucy fossil? Yeah, Australopithecus afarensis. Uh, Higher up in the rock layer, there in Africa, they found another fossil, Australopithecus africanus, the Tamai fossil, they called it. And it was enough higher up in the sequence that by evolution reckoning, it would have lived a million years later. The problem is, it looked more like a monkey than Lucy did. It looked more like a chimp than Lucy, which is exactly the opposite of what their theory said they should find. But it didn't bother them at all. In 1998, National Geographic said it was just an evolutionary reversal. <laughs> Evolution, silly creationist science is for evolutionists, you know? That was the rabbit and tricks, okay. Uh, silly creationist evolution just went backwards for a million years, no prob. But see, they saw something that was exactly, it couldn't have been worse. It couldn't have been a more opposite of what their theory said they should find, but it did not bother them at all. It didn't bother them. They just went on. It's not falsifiable. It can't be refuted. So it's a, it's a, it's a fanatical religious faith. And I say that as a science person. Okay. I, I figure you need another uh, Calvin Hobbes. <clears throat> Here Calvin for a dollar is selling a swift kick in the butt. <laughs> and for a dollar. And he goes, how's business? Terrible. Oh, well, that's, that's hard to believe. I can't understand it. Everyone I know needs what I'm selling. <laughs> and so uh, what we're going to do now, yes, because of the title of the talk, The Three Lies of Evolution, we're really going to give evolution a swift kick in the butt. Because really, just call it like to see it, and what are the problems? I love uh, Stephen Jay Gould because he would admit the problems evolutionists had. I love Thomas Nagel for admitting the logical problems he has trying to be an atheist, you know, and they have their beliefs and they're set in them and that's their right and their privilege, but at least they admit, I know there's problems with this, but this is my belief. And I'm like, fair enough, fair enough. And they don't, uh, uh, and he said, you know, intelligent design isn't stupid at all. Uh, looking at, for design in things as big as the universe or things as small as cells is not stupid. He said, I just think it's wrong. So at least he respects us. 
you know, that's okay. To respectfully disagree with each other, that's civil. But when they get all hot on the collar, start screaming and hollering and calling names, that's when you know, well, their, their position is too weak to use reason and logic. Oh. Problems cannot be solved at the same level of awareness that correct created them. So what I've been trying to do here, what I try to do everywhere I go and speak, I try to change people's level of awareness. And hopefully you're much, much more aware now than you were, you know, yesterday, and you're going about to be more, too. Oh, my wife would hate that grammar I just used. You're going about to be. Okay, well, I'll just pretend I'm doing the Yoda thing, switching my prepositions and verbs. And you're in Texas, it's okay. So what is the evidence for evolution? What are their arguments? Bill and I said there's so many positive things, and evolutionists will say there's overwhelming mountains of evidence. What's the, what is this evidence? Where's the logic? How strong is the case for evolution and in a debate, whether it's me and a professor in front of 400 people, um, or whether it is just you talking with someone at the grocery store. In a debate, what are you really up against? Let's take a look. Here are the major steps in the evolution story. You gotta figure out how everything got here without there being a God. So the universe must have made itself. Then life must have made itself from chemicals floating in the ocean or something, and then from that little bacteria dude, or an archaeobacter, a protobacterium, the first living cell, somehow it had to mutate itself into giraffes and blue whales and Great Danes and horses and dinosaurs and, and tuna fish and, and crabs and lobsters and cockroaches and redwood trees and ferns and club mosses. Everything alive had to come from that one little bacterial. So there's three really big steps that require, yeah, I'm in Menza, yeah. <laughs> three really big steps of, uh, it's another one, okay. How the universe got here, how life got here, and how that life turned into all the different species of life we have. Now, these are not just cherry-picked as their weakest arguments. These are the main turning points on which the whole conception of the universe turns in their theory. And this is exactly the place where they are packing not only nothing, but all the science we know now says each of these steps can't happen by themselves. We have, we have laws of physics and astrophysics and chemistry and biochemistry and laws of biology and genetics um, that say it, it can't happen. It just can't. The strongest one is the beginning, then it gets a little weaker, and then it gets a little maybe if you could find a mechanism, maybe the origin of the species could happen. But there is no mechanism. There's no known mechanism that actually causes this to happen. They just say there's one and leave it at that. And you never see it, kind of like Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. That's just how scientific I see the origin of species. It's like the lost city of Atlantis. Hey, you know, maybe it's there, maybe it's not, but show me the money. Now, in the scientific community and among working scientists, I have found this to be true, that among engineers, people who are responsible for making things work. Among engineers, there's a higher percentage of engineers who just won't go for evolution. Because an engineer has got to make something work. And, and they'll say, well, how does that work? And you say, oh, well, blah, 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 blah. And they go, well, but what's the mechanism? Well, the blah, 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 there is not really, but we, we know someday we'll find out that an engineer will just go get, come back when you've got something. Engineers have to make sure space shuttles don't blow up or uh, suspension bridges don't fall down, or heart-lung machines don't cut out in the middle of open-heart surgery. And engineers are responsible. I have a friend who's a, a member of the Appalachian Creation Science Association. He's actually taller than me. Uh, Brad is six foot eight. I always, when I'm standing next to him, I feel like I have to hold his hand to walk with him. You know, I, I, you know, I feel like a little kid when we go across the street. But Brad said, yeah, all those guys in research and development, they come up with all these ideas. It's up to me to figure out a way to do it without killing anyone. And so engineers are, if it doesn't work, don't talk to me about it. And so there's a higher percent of engineers and medical doctors and uh, veterinarians that I've found who reject evolution because they are not armchair scientists. They depend on science working. Doctors see miracles all the time. The head of the Appalachian Creation Science Association runs his own veterinary hospital. They have a dentist, they have a, a physician who gave me a free 
uh, uh, medical exam, and also Dr. French gave me a free dental exam. That was back when I only made $6,000 a year, so they donated their services to the ministry. Um, but the, all these professional people, uh, the Chicago Creation Group, has all these guys with doctoral degrees like me. You know, we're not, we're not the dumb ones. We're a renegade group, I know. We're the loyal opposition. Well, anyway, how about these three? Let's look at the origin of the universe and just look at a few quotes here. Uh, this is from a college-level um, uh, college uh, astronomy textbook, which actually a friend of Scott Woods sent me by the email this quote from his book. All of astronomy is reasonably unreasonable. That is, reasonable assumptions often lead to unreasonable results. In other words, things that just don't sound like it could really happen. But we make these assumptions, and that makes it OK. That's theorizing, and it's good to have opinions, but don't shove them down people's throats as though it's fact. That's what I disagree with. I like opinions. And failed theories lead the trail up to a theory that works. Failed theories lead a trail up to a theory that someday works. So the wrong theories aren't bad, but it's bad to shove it down people's throats. James Klein, a physicist at McGill University, said this in American Scientist magazine the same year, 2004. Where did matter come from? The best theories of the origin of the universe still fail to explain how it, the universe, managed not to turn up empty. See, if you work the math for the Big Bang Theory back to the beginning, you'll get that the universe popped into existence all by itself with a 50-50 mix of matter and antimatter, an exactly half and half proportion. But what happens if matter and antimatter touch? All you Star Trek fans all know from warp drive engines. They mutually annihilate one another. So if the universe really started with exactly 50% matter and antimatter, it would have gone BANG! <laughs> the universe would have been gone. So evolutionists know this. Big Bang theorists know this. So they introduce a fudge factor into the equation. So when you do this long division problem, you get a little teeny weeny remainder with a little extra matter left over after the matter-antimatter wars were done. And that's our entire universe, that full remainder. Well, you've got to go to pretty extremes. Well, for the fudge factor to work, which is Slightly related to Einstein's cosmological con uh, constant, which Einstein said was the greatest blunder of his career, but whenever evolutionists get in trouble, they usually invoke the cosmological constant. They're doing it for dark energy now, and they know it. Uh, but the, the new uh, chair of uh, physics at Yale, well, it was, she was new about six years ago. I guess she's still there. She was another honest evolutionist. She said, Dark matter is code for, we don't have a clue, <laughs> of dark energy. Dark energy is code for, we don't have a clue. And that's part of the wonder of science, the innocence of science, the humbleness that Einstein said science should make in us. Look, give me a good, honest atheist any day over a compromising believer. Honest unbelievers Jesus spent time with. Sinners, tax collectors, Roman centurions. Uh, but it was the Pharisees that gave him the most trouble. The leaders of the church at the time, the best God followers that walked on the earth were the Pharisees. They kept all the rules, you know. Paul said, I, I kept the rules. I was blameless, you know. They were the ones that gave Jesus a problem. So they're the ones that give us a problem these days, too. Give me a good, honest unbeliever over a compromising believer any day. Okay, so Dr. McGill, I mean, Dr. Dr. Klein says, yeah. Uh, the best theories of the universe don't explain how it didn't manage to turn up empty. Oh, by the way, the fudge factor won't work unless protons could spontaneously decay. Neutrons spontaneously decay. That creates beta radiation in radioactive substances. And so I was talking to a doctoral student who believed this uh, at University of Tennessee Knoxville, and I said, why haven't we ever seen a proton decay spontaneously? He said, well, because the half-life of a proton is 10 to the 40th years. And I just kind of snickered at that. 10 to the 40th years is 1 trillion years times a trillion times how old they think the universe is. So see, they just made a number so big. If you've never seen it happen, I mean, to figure out the speed of something, you have to have at least two snapshots to draw a line between. So he just made that up. 
And I like what, you know, now that I live in Oklahoma, I really, really like uh, Will Rogers. I used to like him before, but he said, scientists get bigger and bigger reputations the more they talk about things you can't check on. <laughs> and that's, that's what they're doing there. They're just putting it out there. And uh, uh, I think it was, uh, I don't know, it was either Newman or it was Gabe was talking about some jellyfish they found with a nervous system, unlike any other nervous system on Earth. So the evolutionists are saying, well, maybe aliens dropped it in our ocean, you know. They'll do it. And, and, it, well, with it, and then a lot of people think aliens put the DNA in our ocean. You saw the movie Mission to Mars, that's what it said. And the panspermia theory is the theory that aliens, advanced aliens, how many saw Expelled, the movie? Expelled? Well, Richard Dawkins was being interviewed by Ben Stein. Richard Dawkins, a famous evolutionist. And Ben Stein said, so you're an atheist. And he goes, well, yes, I am. And he goes, how sure are you that there isn't a god? Because when I'm an atheist, I'm, I'm quite sure. And he said, well, what is it? 50-50, 60-40. What chance do you think there is that we're actually intelligently designed? Because what if you can't put a number on something like that? And he, and, but Ben Stein just pressures him. Because frankly, Ben Stein is way super smart and smarter than Dawkins. He played with him like a cat with a mouse. It was easy for him. And he, he says, all right, well, I am 99% certain that there, there is no problem. We're not intelligent design. So of course, Ben Stein just moves in like a shark. And he goes, well, what about that 1%? You know? And he goes, well, it, of course, it's possible that we were intelligent designed by a highly, highly advanced alien life. And of course, they would have evolved by some Darwinian process. It's like, you know, chicken or egg. And, you know, if aliens made us, then who made the aliens? This is putting the problem so far out there that no one can check on whether you're making sense or not. And I think that's a bad tactic. That's not good science. It's wonderful imagining, like Barney the Dinosaur, this is our imagination. You know, that's great imagining, and it's fun thinking, like Einstein had his thought experiments, but, but even those were based on observations and extrapolation. This is based on nothing. Nothing but hopes and wishes. I'm okay with people's hopes and wishes. Just don't call me dumb, because I don't adopt the same hopes and wishes. Okay, this is a good one. Scientific American Magazine, 1994. Andre Lind, who actually recently got back into the news when they found, um, they found evidence of gravity ripples in space, which would be evidence that maybe gravitons do exist, which would be evidence that maybe the inflationary period of the universe could have really happened. And Lind and another guy were the two big guys that said the inflationary period of the Big Bang Theory happened, and so far they haven't had any proof of that, except one thing, that it inflated at faster than the speed of light, which according to physics that we actually know, nothing can go faster than the speed of light, including the matter and energy that would have had to have gone faster than the speed of light for the Big Bang Theory to work. See, it breaks all these laws of science. It's, it's not like I'm saying we won't discover new stuff that might help them, but based on everything we do know, it's not that we doubt the Big Bang. We have proof it cannot happen. We, we have laws of science that say it can't happen. The speed of light. Uh, the first law of thermodynamics says matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed. The Big Bang Theory says all the matter and energy in the universe created itself out of nothing. That breaks the first law of thermodynamics. Then all the matter organized itself into galaxies and stars and planets. That's against the second law of thermodynamics, the entropy law that says everything's going to the random state. And then you're also breaking the speed limit of the universe, which is uh, the speed of light, 3, 300,000 meters per second, I mean kilometers per second, or 186,000 miles per second. So it breaks three right at the beginning. It breaks three of the known laws of science, but they still fade in. That's fine. But there, what we actually know in science says it can't happen. This is worse than just guessing. We already know it can't be true. But they keep on with it for some reason. The first and main problem is the very existence of the Big Bang. One may wonder what came before. If space-time did not exist then, how could everything appear from nothing? What arose first, the universe or the laws determining its evolution? Explaining this initial singularity, that spot where it all came from, where and when it all began, 
still remains the most intractable problem of modern cosmology. Uh, it's a problem for Big Bang believers, not, not for the God theory of the universe. And for, to a lesser extent, maybe it's not as much of a problem for quantum string theory or for the steady state theory. There are other competing theories for the origin of the universe besides Big Bang. So really, when you look at it, the origin of the universe really doesn't look too good for them. Um, how the universe got started, the Big Bang Theory has deep problems. Aren't you supposed to be doing your homework? I'm pretty sure the assignment was optional. Denial springs eternal. It's not denial, I'm just very selective about the reality I accept. So we're talking about Calvin Hobbes and denial. Well, after the origin of the universe, what about the next step? The origin of life on our planet, at least our planet. George Wall, the guy who talked about how I won't believe in God because I, I choose to believe in what's impossible, evolution. Look at what he said in that same article about the origin of life. The important point is that since the origin of life belongs in the category of at least one phenomena, time is on its side. However improbable we regard this event, the origin of life, all by itself, given enough time, it will almost certainly happen at least once, now watch the logic of Dr. Wall. Uh, given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible becomes probable, and the probable, probable a virtually certain. Do you see in one sentence he went from impossible to certain? That's faith, that's not science. One only has to wait, time itself performs the what? You just hear an atheist use the word miracle. They believe in miracles. I was talking to the Atheist Club at the University of Texas, El Paso. They had come to my five hours of talks that day. And at the end, I finally got them all to admit they believed in miracles. These three miracles. They believed in miracles. They finally admitted to me, all right, Dr. Jackson, we believe in miracles, too. I said, now, I got you. I, I, I understand faith, too. Uh, but, but in my faith, I believe in a miracle maker. And you believe miracles can happen all by themselves, you see. So I, I think this is two different viewpoints, which I think mine is more logical, of course, or I wouldn't have it. <laughs> Michael Denton, who is an evolutionist, wrote a book in 1986 called Evolution, A Theory in Crisis. Look what he said about the origin of life. Considering the way the prebiotic soup, or the, pre, the before life, chemical mix floating in the ocean, considering the way that the uh, primordial soup is referred to in so many discussions on the origin of life as an already established reality, it comes as something of a shock to realize there is absolutely no positive evidence for its existence at all. There's no evidence that there were chemicals floating in the ocean that actually could have become life. Paul Davies, quoted in National Geographic, on National Geographic PBS specials all the time, very well-known physicist, said this in an article in New Scientist magazine in 2003 on my birthday, nice birthday present from Dr. Davies to me, about the origin of life. We have a rough idea when it began on Earth and some interesting theories about where. But the how part has everyone what? Stumped. Nobody knows how lifeless chemicals organize themselves into the first living cells. Again, I'm not making fun of him. I'm proud of him for admitting we feel this happened. We don't really have a good theory for it yet. At least he's being honest. And I like honest people in the church, and I like honest people in the secular world too. I mean, what if somebody's sick and you lay hands on them like the Bible says, you pray for them to get healed and they don't get healed? You know, does that mean God's not real? No, it just means you can't tell what God to do. You know, tell God what to do. He's not, he's not a puppet. He's not your servant. He does what he wants. He makes his rain fall on the just and the unjust. That's not proof there's no God. Now, if someone gets healed of a totally incurable thing, I would kind of lean towards, you know, God. If all the doctors said you're going to die in three days, and we all prayed for someone here, and the doctor said, the eight tumors the size of, of golf balls and basketballs are all gone now. I mean, that would be kind of freaky -o in the favor that there's a God. And, and how many of you have ever known someone who did have a near miraculous or miraculous healing that the doctor said, well, that's a miracle. Yeah. So that's why I said doctors see this sort of thing all the time. And being in the birthing room when a baby's born, 
it's hard to be an atheist then. It really, for me anyway, miracles. So the origin of life thing isn't going too well for them, and they know it, but still the books say, no problem with the Big Bang, no problem with how life got started, don't worry about that, we'll solve it someday. But then how did that one little bacteria dude turn into everything that's alive, including you and me and pterodactyls and, uh, and king crabs? How did that happen? I say if David out the Nile is Dave got the face. From now on, I'm not going to think about anything that's unpleasant. Isn't that a pretty self-deceiving way to go through life? I'm not going to think about that. <laughs> and got a point there. And I'm like, fair. That's fair. But when they're denying it, no. Evolution is a fact for which no further proof is needed. Um, have you ever seen the Colbert Report? The Colbert Report? Oh, okay. Well, he's a comedian that does this uh, uh, comedy act on conservatism. But he had Richard Dawkins on his show, but he also had... Uh, Ted Dashler, the discoverer, one of the discoverers of the fish missing link leading to humans, the fish we evolved from, the tit tat rosé. Long story, it's not, okay. But, uh, but uh, Colbert was interviewing Dashler, and Dr. Dashler said, well, this is the problem with evolution for people. Evolution is hard, and you just got to study. You've got to learn the geology and the paleontology, and you've got to learn the physics and the chemistry. But after you study it long enough, you've just got to believe that evolution is a fact. And of course, Colbert, most, the thing about successful comedians, most of them are super smart. They're very highly intelligent people. And Colbert just swooped in on Dash and he goes, Ah, but if it's a fact, then why do I have to believe it? <laughs> and he had him, and he just went, Ah. He did that for like 30 seconds, and the audience just clapped and cheered, and he just went, Ah. <laughs> Finally, uh, Colbert interrupted that by going, oh, Okay, what, what is this model we have here on, on the table? It was a model of a Tiktaalik Rosetti fossil. And he, he changed the subject mercifully. For, for Dr. Dashler, ended it. Comedians also have very, very good timing in, in their words and stuff. Well, anyway, okay, let's look at the origin of the species. How that one little bacteria turned into all the orders of living things, uh, vertebrates, invertebrates, all the different kinds of plants and insects, mammals, reptiles, birds, fish, uh, all in, in the past uh, 1.5 billion years. Hugo de Vries said in 1905 they knew this was a problem. Natural selection may explain the survival of the, you've heard survival of the fittest, but it cannot explain the arrival of the fittest. See, here's another problem with evolution thinking. What they'll do when they teach evolution is they'll say, look at the African savanna grasslands, the tropical African savanna grasslands, and you'll see these lions and the gazelles, and Natural selection has made the gazelles fast. Because they're not a fast gazelle. There's only two kinds of gazelles on the tropical African savanna. They're quick and they're dead, okay? Because of the lions. So only quick gazelles survive. Well, also, only fast lions get a gazelle lunch, you know, a gazelle happy meal. So if you're a slow lion, you're probably not going to get enough food. So slow lions probably don't get enough nutrition. They maybe die, get sick. They don't reproduce well. They don't become the alpha male in the pride of lions. And slow gazelles become lunch for an alpha lion who sends the female lion out to do the killing. It's the, the women lions do hunting, bring it back to the male. It's real interesting stuff. But we'll, we'll, I don't want to start singing the circle of life or anything. OK. Um, but you know what they do is they, it's like a magician. How many saw that Hugh Jackman movie, The Prestige? with Michael King about magicians and what they do. What they do is they get you looking here at something. Meanwhile, back here they're doing something. That's what's happening. There's where the action is. But they get you looking out here at fast lions, fast gazelles, natural selection, survival of the fittest. Only the fast survive. So there's fast gazelles and fast lions. Whew, evolution is true. The real thing that evolution says it's got the answer to, though, is not just how we got fast lions and fast gazelles. See, that would happen if God made lions and gazelles 6,000 years ago. A slow arg or be eaten. Natural selection is part of the creation theory of life. Okay? And it's also part of the evolution theory. But back behind what they're hiding behind, don't pay no attention to that man behind the curtain, is this. 
Where did lions and gazelles come from in the first place? Not natural selection might explain survival of the fittest, but it can't explain how the fit got there in the first place. Where did lions and gazelles come from? Did they all come from the Morganukadon Erli rat that lived 210 million years ago during the Triassic? That's the theory. They don't like to admit that. Lions and gazelles both came from a rat. This process can work for 50 billion years, and you still won't change lions and gazelles, and anything else except faster and faster, and better and better lions and gazelles, just by weeding out the ones that have errors in them. And if the creation theory is true, lions and gazelles started out perfect. And really everything's gone downhill since then. But that's part of our theory. But this is true about evolution. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould, how many have heard of these fossils they're looking for to show how the change happened, like from fish to amphibians, or from amphibians to reptiles, or from reptiles to birds, or reptiles to mammals, or pouch mammals to placental mammals like us, you know, the, and monotremes, and then, then uh, lemurs to you know, possums and monkeys, and then all the way up to us. They're always looking for fossils called the missing Missing link. This is what Dr. Gould is talking about here, and he's telling the truth. Dr. Gould hated creationists. He was very much opposed against us. I heard him speak. Very smart man. Very reasonable man. I wish I could have like had coffee at Starbucks with him before he died, and, but he did get letters from people saying they were praying for his soul, and he just laughed about it. But look at what Dr. Gould said. At least he's honest. He says, the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record Oh, what's transitional forms? Missing links. He said, the missing links are missing. He says, it's a, it persists as a trade secret of fossil science. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks, uh, like this one, these little family trees showing how amoebas turned into everything else. He says, the evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and the nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. So most of it's made up imaginary, because then missing links are missing. They hate the word missing link, but he's at least willing to bite the bullet and talk about it. I like that about him. Ernst Mayer died at 101 years old. He wrote his opus magnum on, on evolution called What is Evolution? Uh, before Stephen Jay Gould died, he also wrote his opus magnum on, uh, um, on evolution. And Dr. Mayer said this, whenever we look at the living life forms, biota, the, the discontinuities, the breaks, are even more striking in the fossil record. New species usually appear in the layers, suddenly not connected with ancestors by a series of missing links. It's all through every kind of living thing. You know, uh, we've got tons and tons of fish fossils, tons and tons of amphibian fossils, no fish amphibians. And that's what they were saying to the Alec was. We've got tons and tons of dinosaur fossils, tons and tons of bird fossils, no dinosaur birds. Oh, yes, that's one of my favorite topics. That's pretty bogus, the way they constructed that story. And we have, we have these um, uh, little uh, Eohippus fossils, um, uh, Hyracotherium fossils. That, they, that looks like a little bambi, and they say that turned into the modern horse, Equus. And they've got to try and put all these missing links together, but they don't work, and they're from different continents, and the rib numbers change along the way, and, and all kinds of bad things happen for an evolutionist, so most evolutionists don't even use. The guy who wrote the book on horse evolution, Bruce McFadden, at Florida State Museum, says that the entire horse evolution thing is bogus. It's not the way they thought it happened. And so they've, they've gone back to the blackboard, and again, Dr. McFadden, I appreciate his honesty on that. So there's, there's the story. Let's just take a look at dinosaurs. Everyone likes dinosaurs. Usually Creation Truth Foundation comes and does dinosaur talks, but that's not what Mark asked me to talk about. Obviously, i got plenty of stuff I can talk about. But let's just look at dinosaurs. Let's look at the fossil record for dinosaurs. In, in the layers where there aren't any dinosaur fossils, and when you go higher and higher up, evolutionists think you're going further and further in time and getting closer and closer to the present. So as you go through the dinosaur age, the Mesozoic, the middle life stage, 
of the history of life according to evolution, which includes you know, the Jurassic, Triassic, uh, uh, Cretaceous. Um, let's take a look at those fossils. This is a chart of the family tree of dinosaurs. In the red is where we have actual fossils that prove that that part of the dinosaur family tree existed. We have fossils of these creatures that look the way they should look if they went there in the family tree. But notice where it's blank. Every single place that it's blank is where evolution took one kind of reptile and turned it into a dinosaur or a bunch of different kind of dinosaurs. And then every place where one kind of dinosaur by the magic and power of evolution turned into other kind of dinosaurs, that's where there's no fossils. The missing links are systematic. In other words, there, we only don't have fossils where evolution was doing its thing. Right when, we, when evolutionists need there to be a fossil, that's where there's not one. So they just about go by faith that these blank places where the big change, where little 5A turns into all these other things, uh, and this one here turns into all these, that's where they don't have, the, and the same thing for humans. We have plenty of orang fossils and gorilla fossils and chimpanzee fossils and human fossils, but it's right at the places where people and chimps parted ways that there's no missing link, right where the other kinds of primates, now we are similar to monkeys. We have fingernails instead of claws. We have stereoscopic vision, frontward pointing eyes. We have a relatively large brain. Uh, and, and our fingers are very different from theirs. And you know, they have a hand on the end of their leg. Uh, but, but primates all have these different traits we're talking about. And uh, so, but when you look at the other primates, uh, just when orangs split off from the rest of the primates, that one, that's when there's no fossil. Just when the great gorillas of uh, Pongidae split out from Hominidae um, and, and the other primates, uh, that's where there's no fossil showing that event ever happened. It's always that way in every one of the types of living things, where the only place there aren't fossils is where evolution did its thing and the change took place. So the change taking place is a matter of faith, which, like I said, I don't have any problem with, but when they say there's all these fossils that show it, that's just, that ain't true. It never is true in any of the situations. There's only one fossil sequence that actually lo looks okay for evolutionists, and that is the change of vertebrates, things with a backbone, in other words, fish, from water environment to living on the land the only sequence that has any decent set of fossils you could line up and say this tells the story. But the flood of Noah would have arranged those fossils in exactly that order, and that's the only sequence they have that's good. Insects, a nightmare to get little water fleas to turn into flying moths and grasshoppers. Plant evolution, a nightmare to try to get of water plants and, sh and show fossils that show that they became land plants. Um, the, uh, Darwin said that the origin of flowering plants was that abominable mystery, changing from naked seed plants or gymnosperm, like pine trees and ferns, into flowering plants like magnolia trees and rose bushes. He said that was abominable, and it still is abominable. I heard the world's leading authority on that part of evolution speak at the University of Oklahoma, Pam Sofelt, I think was her name. And she was real honest too. And I even got to ask a question during question and answer period, and she admitted, yeah, that's pretty much based on, on you know, uh, assumptions and imagination, but it's the best we've got right now. And I'm like, thank you for telling that. You know, and it was true. Oh, oh, let's see, what have I got here? There we go. So how are they doing on these things? All of them. How the universe got here, how life got here, how the species, origin of the species, the title of Darwin's book, they're not doing so good. The three lives of evolution are the main three big matters in evolution thinking. Time for your bath, let's go. Sorry, I'm in denial about that. All right, go ahead and deny it. Nobody respects my denial. So I'm making fun, but I'm also making a lighter joke since I've been so heavy the whole time. Max Planck, if you've ever heard of the Planck constant, uh, Max Planck was a personal friend of Albert Einstein's. He was also a Nobel Prize winning physicist. 
during Einstein's lifetime. Look at what he said. Whenever an experimental finding contradicts the accepted theory, another step on the ladder of progress is thereby announced. For the contradiction between experiment and theory, the contradiction signifies the accepted theory must be overhauled and improved, or trashed, you see. And I like that Planck said that. Planck also believed that there was a personal God. So did Einstein believe there was a God, too. And this came from a famous court case in Dover, Pennsylvania. The judge ruled against uh, the intelligent design people, Stephen Meyer and his buddy, uh, uh, Michael Behe was there at the trial, so was Eugenie Scott and the ACLU, and Kenneth Miller, all of these Sith Lords of Evolution were there at the trial in Dover. Look at how the judge ruled. This is from the Washington Post newspaper. Science cannot be defined differently for Dover, Pennsylvania students than it is defined in the scientific community. Just because scientists today cannot explain how biological systems evolve, does not mean that they cannot and will not be able to explain them tomorrow. That's an expression of hope and faith and wishing, and that's okay, but they find a little teeny school district that had 1,800 people living in that town. They found, find that town $2 million for putting a book on intelligent design in the library and telling the two science classes that it was there. That's all. Yep, yep, I heard Eugenie Scott speak on that, and she said, we showed them. And, and she made the, and little towns are afraid to be bullied by the ACLU now. That was exactly, that's a matter of history, that's a court record, that's exactly what happened. And I actually have all the evidence, and if you want to see, in question and answer period here, because we couldn't really do that earlier this morning. Um, you can ask anything that you want that's pertinent to this. It doesn't have to be all about the three lies. It could be about missing links. It could be anything you read in National Geographic or Omni or Wired or in a science textbook or you heard a professor or a teacher say or something you saw on Animal Planet or Discovery Channel or history. Any, anything you have seen or heard or read anywhere that made you go, oh my goodness, that's just totally proof for evolution. I don't dare tell Brother Mark he'll deny Jesus and go to hell. So that's the question I want. I don't need the easy questions. You know, I'm here. I can answer the difficult questions. The ones that are bothering you or the ones that you think they've got us on. Now, I'm not going to say I know the answer to every question, but it's very, very rare that I don't have an answer that goes, oh, let me tell you about that. Um, like, you know, that we used to have tails. We have a tail bone. That, that's, that's ridiculous. Like our appendix has no use. That's that's stupid. Uh, I'm sorry, that's ignorant, not stupid. Stupid is not uh, is not being able to know. Ignorant is not knowing yet. Uh, so, but but all these kind of different things that are there. Anything you've heard, let's clear it up. And if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you. I don't know. I don't know everything. It just seems that way. I really don't. And I'm not ashamed to say it. I don't. I can tell you what people say about these things and the arguments. Sometimes I don't really know an answer, and chances are there isn't an answer out there, and, no, and they're still fighting about it, and nobody really has any solid ammo, just opinions, and I'll tell you if that's like this, like UFOs and the Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot. Kupachabra, they caught one, didn't they? Yeah. Frozen one. I saw it on Facebook, so it must be real. Um, so, anyway, Mark, is that good? Do you want to just segue right into question and answer time now? Is that what we want to do? Uh, yeah, if you're good. I am. So whatever I'm here for you, as long as you need me, I kind of uh, figured I'd be here for a while. And question and answer period has gone three and a half hours in the past. Uh, not that I expect you to do that, uh, but there's a small enough group I can probably answer every question you've got. And if you make them the kind of questions don't like ask, can you tell me the history of the universe? <laughs> so that took 6,000 years. and I. And, no, I mean, but I'll try and answer them as quickly as I possibly can. Sometimes I just go, no, and everybody laughs, but I said, you want the short answer? Okay, uh, I, I will go, if I have any, like, charts or graphs or little videos or something I can show you that will help to answer the question you ask, then I will use them from my resources here. Okay, anybody?
Alex? Oh, oh. Oh, all right. Yeah, that's kind of silly. Oh, that's kind of silly. Oh, that's kind of silly. Wait a minute, I thought I had that right here. Oh, that's anatomy. That's that message from anatomy and fossils. I know I have a picture of the tailbone. The coccyx, the end of the spinal column. Still looking for it. I know I got a picture of it. It's just easier to talk about. See, I told you I'd go fast, and what do I do? Hmm. I'm surprised. I'm still, I'm still holding out hope that I can find this. genes contain the evolutionary perfection of earthly DNA. I am a culmination of creation. With no tail? I don't think so. Stop that. My butt doesn't need aesthetic enhancement. But here's, here's the skeleton of a, of a human, and this is your tailbone, or the coccyx. It's a little peeny bone down there, and what evolutionists will say in textbooks is it's a vestigial organ, a vestige from long ago when we used to have tails when we were fish and then rats. And it proves, because it has no use today, it's a vestige, a throwback from a time in our evolutionary history. Well, it depends on the coccyx not being useful. But there's, in the 1930s, there were like 180 organs on the useless organ list. And they said that all of them were proof of evolution. Well, see, we thought we were so smart that if we couldn't figure out what it does, it must not do anything. I, it's been 10 years since I've ever heard an evolutionist try to use this argument on me because they, they know it doesn't work now. And then they were using, since they couldn't get vestigial organs or junk organs that are junk from the past, then they went with junk DNA, vestigial DNA. They couldn't figure out what 98% of our DNA was doing, and they did the same logical error. Since we're so smart, if we can't figure out what that DNA is doing, it must not be doing anything. Again, that was an argument from ignorance, and it turned out in 2012 to finally be completely brain-dead, dirt-stupid bogus. It makes me mad because I had that thrown in my face in 1996 by the Dean of Sciences and the Chair of Biology at the college where I was working, and they laughed at me because I said someday we're going to find out a purpose, a use for the junk DNA. In 2007, they started finding out. In 1999, just three years later, they had the first hints junk DNA was doing something. In 2012, uh, dozens of reports from all over the world finally were combined, and we now know the junk DNA are the master control genes of the genome of every living thing on the planet. All the other genes do stuff uh, and make proteins but the junk DNA sequences are where the master control homeobox genes, the Hox genes, where the master regulatory genes are that tell all the other genes it's the nervous system of our DNA, which tells all the other genes when to kick in and make you have puberty and pimples. You don't have pimples, so I can say it. Make you have puberty, it, they kick in um, when, when different life stages happen, like when you're unborn and it's time to grow arms and legs, these genes kick in. Uh, and these genes tell all the other genes what to do when it's time to do it and how much to do it. We figured out there's only two amino acids different in the, uh, in the hormone that controls human brain growth and chimp brain growth. We're talking about a, a gene, uh, we're talking about a, a hormone that probably has about four or 500 amino acids in it, so only two of them are different between humans and chimps, where our brains are three times bigger and we can talk. So Sante Pabo, I did say I would make it short, but oh, 
Um, Sande Pablo at the Max Planck Institute for Research in Leipzig, Germany, did the CHIMP Genome Project and the Neanderthal Genome Project and said, only two amino acids isn't enough to explain the difference. Something else must be going on. He hypothesized that it was how much of the, of the uh, hormone that was released that made the difference, not what the structure was. And it was the master control genes that, uh, that were doing this. And it was the regulatory part that tells the hormone how much to make and when. And that's the key to jump-starting human brain development rather than monkeys. But monkeys are programmed to be, have monkey-sized brains, and we are programmed to have human-sized brains. So, OK, the tailbone. I was speaking in Venezuela to a, a high school group. And they combined two high school classes and asked me to speak on a topic similar to this. And a student asked a question about the tailbone. Little did I know that their teacher, who was standing right there, had bone cancer of her coccyx and had to have her coccyx surgically removed. Saved her life. But while I was talking about it, the teacher had to leave the room because she could not stand or sit comfortably for very long in the same position. You're using your coccyx right now. It's the end of your spinal column. It dips down under. You're sitting on it. And I like what creationist Dr. Dwayne T. Gish said. And frankly, can you think of a better way to end a spinal column? <laughs> it's not a tail. You're using it now. It's useful. Also. Uh, you know that your abs, your six-pack, six pack, holds in your guts from the front. There are no bones doing it. It's just muscles. Your rib cage stops above your guts. Okay, so your 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 six-pack holds it in from here. But behind the uh, there's a vase-shaped set of muscles that all lead down to the front of the coccyx and attach there and hold it in from back there. Plus all the muscles that do go down to your lower back all connect. You got it to the back of the coccyx. And you know how important that is, lower back pain and all that. Plus, how many of you have ever bounced down some stairs on your coccyx? You know what? There's a lot of nerve endings in the coccyx. That hurts more than breaking any other bone, is what I've heard. I've never broken mine, but I heard it smarts and kills like murder. If God didn't make the coccyx for a reason, why would he have put so many nerve endings in there for, to protect it? And if evolution doesn't still have a purpose for that, why waste the biological energy and resources in your body to put so many nerve endings in that stupid little useless organ? You should just crack it off and not care. But no, also, the muscles for controlling your rectum are yeah, anchored on the coccyx. And the muscles in human females for childbirthing, for parturition, are anchored on the coccyx. This science, I tell this to the class, and, this, and they were all sort of laughing. I wondered, this is not funny. The Venezuelan sense of humor is different from, from ours, and I never knew what was going to make them laugh. Sometimes I'd try and it wouldn't work, and sometimes I'd say something like mammoth on, and they cracked. They just thought that was hilarious. It's a, a mammoth elephant. You know, you all would like that here because you're mammoth fossils. Well, anyway, um, the t they, they laughed because the teacher had already told them, hey, if you're a biology teacher and you got surgery, you're showing your students x-rays, and you've got your gallbladder in a little jar, you'll show it to them, you know, if you're a science teacher. She had told them all the problems she had. The uh, bone uh, cancer was removed. They got it all and it saved her life, but she couldn't sit or stand comfortably in the same position. Her third child had to be done by cesarean section because she couldn't push anymore, and she had to reconstruct a surgery on her rectum so she could control her bowel movements. Useless organ? No, nah, no. Nah. The appendix? Um, the appendix is highly vascularized with lymph vessels which insinuates, like the tonsils and the adenoids and the, uh, the, the uh, lymph nodes in your armpits and your gland center here, signifies that it is highly associated with your immune system. We've discovered that the appendix confers immunity to one particular strain of polio. We found that the appendix also, before your red blood cells are manufactured, when you're an embryo, before your red blood cells start getting manufactured in your large bones, like your humerus and your, your femur, um, the, uh, the appendix generates red blood cells before you have a spleen, before you have bones. So it's useful in any life stage, it's useful. Um, also, later in life, we believe that the appendix now 
harbors uh, bacterial colonies so that if you have bad diarrhea or you get sick and you lose a lot of the bacteria, the good bacteria, E. coli, that live in your colon, uh, we believe that kind of like, uh, what's that lump of bread that's got the uh, dough that's got the yeast in it? They call it Arthur. Yeah, but they'll, they'll take pieces and give it to women and it'll keep growing the yeast. Friendship, that friendship bread, like friendship bread, your appendix just holds back a little, a little sample of those E. coli. So if you lose it for some reason, like if you take nasty antibiotics, they'll kill your bacteria, but then your funguses will go all through you and make you sick. So your appendix goes and squirts that reserve of bacteria. And also we think it lubricates, it helps lubricate the large intestine. So all these functions for the appendix I've heard, now you can live without it. You can live without your left arm, too. If I was, was going to die from gangrene in my left arm, they'd have to cut it off. I could live, but it did not mean I did not have uses for it while I had it. And so all of these things, wisdom teeth, tonsils, the supposed legs in whales, showing that they used to be cows and deers or wolves, what they believe, um, uh, the appendix, of course, uh, the blind cave fish, all of these stories. I got all these pictures from an evolutionist website, okay? Uh, there are no vestigial organs anymore. There's not a single organ in the body that we don't know what its use is. There aren't any things that show that God's a bad designer. Even the inverted retina in the eye, uh, it's ridiculous. Uh, the only eyeballs that aren't inverted retina are mollusk eyes. And octopuses have, octopi have eyes very similar to ours, but an eagle is a vertebrate. All vertebrates have inverted retinas, like ours. An eagle can see a fish underwater a mile away. You just can't argue with success. Don't tell me that's not good design, because it is. Um, you just look at the results. We have figured out some of the advantage of the inverted retina versus the normal retina. Uh, but our retina, is behind a bunch of nerves and blood vessels that are in the way of us seeing. But that also absorbs a bunch of the uh, light energy so that the retina doesn't overheat. Um, they, these, these, these things are exactly the distance uh, in front of the cells, the uh, light sensing cells, the rods and cones, so that they're kind of in between them and they're invisible to you. Uh, it's just the design is not only there, it's incredible and the results of it are, are brilliant, they're ingenious. So our eyes are better than an octopus, but not as good as a hawk or eagle. Eagles have them anyway. Okay, so yeah, there aren't any such things as useless organs. So you asked about the appendix and the tailbone, so there you go. Yes, sir. Can you explain the corrective uh, feline or tell me get one evolutionist will say that there's your little teeny muscles, and you know uh, every single place where you have a, a pore, there's a little hair growing out. Now, you know, the hairs are filial hairs here, except for on your palms and the soles of your feet. Uh, but uh, terminal hairs are the ones that you can see. Filial hairs are the ones you can't. They're little peach fuzzy things. And all mammals have a hair coming out of every pore. Well, also, every pore has a little microscopic muscle that pulls and will pull the hair up. Like if you get scared or uh, you get cold. Now, this can be in response to, yes, cold. And, and what they're saying is that that was when we were rats and we used to fluff up our fur, like birds fluff up their feathers. Of course, why would evolution keep that if it doesn't work anymore for this? Uh, now, it's also, it's also a heat um, venting process. If you, if you have a, um, a jump in, me in metabolism, you can vent your heat better if these pores, these, you get the goosebumps and it increases surface area. And let's see, what was the other thing about it? It is actually not, in humans, a fight or flight, um, not fight or flight, it's not really the way it was for, yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly what the, how that went. Think of when you get goosebumps. It's not when someone actually surprises you, like you puff up, you know, to look more formidable. It's when you're having an emotional reaction. 
if you are getting spooked by something and you're in here in the church alone and you hear Wayne, Wayne, hell is waiting, Wayne, for you. Yeah, you'll get goosebumps because yeah, you're worried, you're nervous. Well, that's because you have assurance of your salvation. Okay, it's an emotional response thing, and uh, you don't always get it when you're scared. You also get it when you're very impressed by something. You know, you'll say, that gives me goosebumps. So, and animals don't get that. They get that when they when they want to uh, do a, a aggressive posturing. You know, like if, if a dog's mad at you, the hair will all rise up on his back. And, and that is, you know, puffing up, looking more aggressive. And I'm trying to remember all of the things that go with that. It's clear what it's, what it's doing in animals. Uh, they, they do that. That would actually make a dog get colder. So he's not going to do that to stay warm in the winter. Um, birds will fluff up their feathers. But this is a, uh, it's a, it's a fight or flight thing. They're getting ready for a fight. With humans, it's an emotional response to a number of things. We